The Bible, as the Word of God, has a marvelous and peculiar power. In the words of Psalm 19, it can refresh the soul and make the simple wise. It can give joy to the heart and light to the eyes. But the Bible, as the Word of God, also has a unique ability to contradict and offend. That is to contradict our deeply held beliefs as well as offend our sensibilities. And I think this morning's passage bears out these qualities very well. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 17 and let us look at the Word of God together. We will be considering verses 1 through 10 of Luke chapter 17. Beginning in verse 1, Jesus said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink? and afterward you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves, we have only done that which we ought to have done. Note that Jesus begins his words to his disciples by saying in verse 1 that stumbling blocks are inevitable. Now, stumbling blocks are those things that tempt us to sin or cause us to fall or stumble into sin. And stumbling blocks can come in the form of words and they can come in the form of of deeds. And Jesus assures his disciples that these stumbling blocks are in fact inevitable. They are certain and sure to come. They cannot be avoided. Now of course the reason for this is the fact that you and I as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ live in a fallen and corrupt world. And the scriptures know of two ages, this age and the age to come. And this age, the scriptures tell us, are under the power of the evil one. Paul describes Satan as the God of this age, that he is the tempter, and he is seeking often to put stumbling blocks in the paths of Christ's disciples. And as long as we live in this corrupt world, we are going to face stumbling blocks. We are going to face various and multi-offenses. We are going to be tempted time and time again 
to sin. It will not be until Jesus Christ returns and he ushers in the fullness of the age to come that stumbling blocks will be no more. And so Jesus draws this fact to the attention of his disciples. Understand the world in which you live. Recognize that there are stumbling blocks that are going to come. But the one thing you must guard against and realize is that you may in fact be that stumbling block. That stumbling block may come through you. And Jesus does not mince his words in verse 1. For those stumbling blocks are sure to come, and they cannot be avoided, yet woe to him through whom they come. It is one thing for you and I to be tempted or even made to stumble or fall into sin. But it is quite another for us to be a tempter or cause of another stumbling. And Jesus says, woe to that one who causes another to trip up, stumble and fall with respect to their faith and discipleship of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't have to think very long or hard to recall the Apostle Peter and the stumbling block that he was prone to be. You may remember that in Matthew 16, Peter becomes not a stumbling block to one of his fellow disciples, but he becomes a stumbling block to the Lord himself. In Matthew 16, Jesus begins to make it very plain what is about to occur. He's going to go to Jerusalem, and he's going to suffer many things, and he's going to die. The point cannot be missed. It's expressed in the plainest of terms. And yet Peter says, Lord, this must never happen to you. And he actually takes Jesus aside and offers a mild rebuke. You see, Peter was thinking with the mind of man and did not have in his heart the things of God. And what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, using this very same word that we find here in Luke 17, verse 1. You see, Peter had become at that point an obstacle in our Lord's path as he set his mind and heart towards Jerusalem and what the Father had ordained for him, suffering and death upon a cross. And so Jesus rebuked Peter, and Peter felt the weight of that rebuke, that he had served as a stumbling block, as a cause of offense to none other than the Messiah himself. Now notice what Jesus Christ says with regard to the one who would serve as a stumbling block to a fellow disciple. Verse 2, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Feel the weight of Jesus' words and the power of the woe that he pronounces upon the one who would be a stumbling block to the faith of another. Essentially, Jesus is saying here to suffer death by drowning, essentially becoming a human anchor is a more favorable outcome than the judgment that awaits the one through whom stumbling blocks come. Now this informs us then why the Apostle Paul was so absolutely committed to never placing a stumbling block in a fellow believer's way. 
You see, the believers in Corinth had become accustomed to meat offered to idols. And Paul says, we know, we have knowledge in 1 Corinthians 8 that an idol is nothing. And so meat that was sacrificed or offered to an idol can be eaten with a clear conscience. But some in the church had become so accustomed to the idol that the thought of eating that food was a cause of offense. And Paul says, if you then go and you partake of that meat that was offered to an idol, because you are strong in your faith, and a weaker brother observes your eating, will he not be then bolstered and encouraged to partake of the same? And so he then eats, and in his eating, he stumbles, he offends, and disturbs his own conscience. And in so doing, he sins. And so what does Paul say? Because of his love for his fellow brethren, knowing that Jesus Christ laid down his life for them, he says, I will never eat meat again if eating meat would cause my brother to stumble. You see, Paul understood the words of Jesus Christ and the woe that he is proclaiming here. Paul wanted to be as far from serving as a stumbling block to his fellow brethren as possible. And if it meant giving up the eating of meat and corn, then so be it. That's what Paul would do. Jesus, notice in verse 2 says, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. In Matthew 18 or Matthew 17, we find out that these little ones are those who believe in Jesus. And you can hear the term of endearment as Jesus refers to his followers as his little ones. You see, brothers and sisters, God's people are precious in the sight of Jesus Christ. And he does not want his followers, and certainly not those who would lead in the church, to be a source of stumbling to these precious saints. They are his little ones. In another place, Jesus refers to his disciples as his little flock. And he says to his disciples, my little flock, don't be afraid. My father has chosen to give to you the kingdom. So rejoice. This is the attitude that Jesus' disciples, his apostles, must assume. They must realize that Jesus Christ has precious little ones, saints, his people, his followers, his disciples. And they must resolve to never place a stumbling block in the path of one of Christ's followers. And so we're not surprised then to find in verse 3 Jesus saying, Be on your guard. Watch yourselves. Proceed in life circumspectly. Guard your steps and ensure that neither by word nor by deed are you the source of the stumbling of another. Be on your guard. Now in verse 3, the focus is going to shift from the one who sins against others to the one who is sinned against. Look with me at the latter half of verse 3. If your brother sins against you, as we find in verse 4, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, 
I repent. Forgive him. Now, in these two verses, our Lord issues to his disciples two commands. His disciples have a duty to both rebuke and forgive. And it's important to notice the context in which these words are issued. For Jesus says in verse 3, if your brother sins. So the context is the believing community and a fellow follower of Jesus Christ who then sins against you. You have a duty. In fact, there are two of them that Jesus outlines here. You have a duty to rebuke that brother, and you also have a duty to forgive that brother. But notice that both of these responsibilities or obligations are presented by the Lord as conditional. You rebuke your brother, but only if he sins against you. And you are to forgive your brother if he repents. You see, it's important for us to grasp that sometimes forgiveness is conditional. Jesus is telling his disciples that it's when your brother repents of his sin against you, it is then that you offer to him your forgiveness. Now recognize that the default position of being a Christian is found in Proverbs 19.11. And we would all do well to learn this scripture. It is the glory of a man to overlook an offense. That should be the default position from which we as Christians operate. We are to be those who are quick to forgive and overlook an offense. And yet, there will be times when the nature of the sin committed against us is so serious that the relationship has been ruptured. And the only way that that relationship can be repaired is if the one who has committed the offense against us repents of their sin. Now notice the context in which these words are offered by our Lord Jesus. He's already talked about the sin of serving as a stumbling block, a sin that is so severe and serious that he says you would be better off to become a human anchor and have a millstone tied around your neck and to be cast into the heart of the sea. These are not small sins, if we can use that word. We know that we all commit various offenses one against the other. And we are to be a people of grace in the church who are ready and willing and even eager to overlook an offense. But when the sin is of such a serious nature that that relationship has been ruptured, it requires the repentance of the offending party if there is to be peace and full reconciliation once again. And Paul really serves as an example to us in this regard. You may recall that in Corinth, there was an individual who treated the apostle unjustly. And he undermined Paul's authority. And in so doing, he brought great pain upon the Apostle Paul. And the sorrow was so great that Paul then set out to write a letter to this church. And it's a letter that we no longer have. But in that letter, he encourages the saints there to reprove this individual and to put him out of the church. And so, to Paul's delight, the church in Corinth follows the apostolic instructions that they received and they put this brother out of the church and he was separated from the company of his fellow believers. But the outcome of that separation 
was such that it produced great sorrow in the heart of that offender. And the sorrow became so great that it brought him to repentance. And he confessed his wrongdoing. And Paul became aware now of this man's repentance. And Paul, being willing and ready to forgive, told this church in 2 Corinthians, a letter that we do have, it's time for you to now forgive that brother. It's time for you to reaffirm your love for him and receive him back into the community of faith. Because if you don't, the sorrow may overwhelm him. And he may be overtaken with grief. And we love this brother. And he has met the condition for being received back into the fellowship of the saints. And so the Corinthians then were to follow that second apostolic instruction and reaffirm their love for this brother. And Paul says, Forgive him. Forgive him. But where there is repentance, there must be forgiveness. Even, Jesus says, as he expands upon his words, even seven times a day. Look with me at verse 4. If he sins against you even seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Note that Jesus is calling his apostles and by extension you and I to be characterized by an extravagant forgiveness. Why? Because this, brothers and sisters, reflects the heart of our Father in heaven. You see, God is a God who is generous in the forgiveness that he offers to us. He is a God who is patient and long-suffering, and he places no limits on the number of times that he forgives you and I. And we know from James and his letter that we all stumble in many ways, do we not? And yet, we are assured that each and every time that we approach our Father in an attitude of humility, confessing our sins, we are assured that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As sons of the Father, Jesus' disciples, those who would follow the Christ, must be large-hearted and ready and willing to forgive a brother who has grievously sinned against him when that condition of repentance is met. And they are to be prepared to offer that forgiveness time and time again. For this reflects the heart of our gracious God towards us. Well, as you can imagine, the disciples are feeling the full weight and impact of Jesus' words. And so we find in verse 5 the apostles saying to the Lord, increase our faith. You see, from the disciples' perspective, the duty that Jesus has laid upon them seems beyond reach. It's too much for them to attain. How are we to comply, Lord, unless our faith is enlarged? I think of the words of Augustine, who said, Lord, give what you command and command what you will. You see, the Lord's commands to us, we realize how shaky our obedience is. We recognize how weak we are. And we see that we lack the strength to do all that our Lord has commanded. And Augustine recognized that and he said, Lord, if you will but give what you command, then you command what you will. 
You see, God is the one who gives to us the ability, first of all, to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. As you read the book of Acts and the history of the early church, you find Luke telling us that God granted them repentance and that it was God who ordained a certain number unto eternal life that they might believe in the Son of God. The Lord gives to us many and various commands and it is our duty to obey them all. And yet we realize, God, we are but jars of clay. We are weak. How are we to fulfill your commands as your slaves, as your servants? Please, God, increase our faith. Now, the words of the disciples sound reasonable to us. But note the response of Jesus Christ in verse 6. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Now the disciples no doubt had seen a mustard seed and they knew that it was proverbial for being the smallest of seeds. They could almost in their mind's eye picture themselves holding this mustard seed in the palm of their hand and looking at that seed and recognizing Jesus is saying, this is all the faith that we need. You see, the disciples thought they needed an extraordinary faith. But Jesus is telling them, no, ordinary faith will do. To accomplish great things, brothers and sisters, we need not a supersize faith. What we need is authentic faith, genuine faith, because it is through faith that we are connected and united to Jesus Christ. And as long as the branch is attached to the vine, that life nourishing sap is going to flow into the heart of that believer. And God is going to enable us then to do the very things that the world cannot accomplish. Now to forgive a brother over and over again is no small thing. Just like uprooting a mulberry tree is no small thing. But all that it requires is ordinary faith in Jesus Christ. And He will then work through you by the power of His Spirit, enabling you to do that which the world finds impossible to accomplish. Sadly, I've heard stories of even extended family members who for years and years refused to speak to one another because of an offense that literally happened decades ago. You see, the human heart being corrupted by the fall and full of sin, finds forgiveness, a virtual impossibility. And so they cling to that offense and they harbor bitterness. But it must not be so with you and I. We must be large-hearted. We must be prepared to forgive when offended over and over again. And in so doing, we show that we are in fact sons of the living God. Notice what Jesus then goes on to say in order to illustrate this point that he is making and the duty that belongs to his disciples. A duty that as duty is ill-deserving then of praise. You see, it would be easy for the apostles to perhaps think they could place God in their debt if they were to forgive over and over again. But Jesus wants them to understand that this duty that he is calling them to is simply that which a servant or slave is to render to his master and that it does not call forth any special commendation from the master. 
So Jesus now is going to employ yet another parable. He's going to draw from the course of ordinary life in the first century and from the society in which the disciples lived in order to make a spiritual truth pregnant and piercing to their hearts and minds. And what he does now in verses 7 through 10 is to tell a parable involving the most basic of command compliance relationships. That relationship that exists between a master and his slave. Look at me, look with me at verse 7. Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterward, you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? You see, the disciples would have immediately recognized the point that Jesus was making. For they well understood that slaves, by the very nature of things, do what? Serve their masters. And in serving their masters, they are deserving of neither reward, verse 7, nor commendation, verse 9, in fulfilling their duty. Perhaps in our society, a similar illustration might be drawn from the military. Think of a sergeant issuing a command to his soldier to fall in line. Do you think that that sergeant would then thank that soldier for complying? I mean, the very thought of it is ludicrous. And in the same way, the disciples understood the impact of Jesus' words. Slaves do what they are told. And they are not patted on the back for fulfilling their duties. Now, Jesus has given his disciples some very clear duties and obligations to obey. They are to rebuke when they are seriously sinned against in order to produce repentance. And when repentance is forthcoming, they are to forgive and there is to be no limit on the extent of that forgiveness. And Jesus is drilling home the point to them that this is their duty and that it does not call forth any special praise from their master and Lord Jesus Christ I think of the mini series that came out in 2008 called John Adams and in that television series John Adams is speaking with George Washington and George Washington proceeds to offer to John Adams his army for the defense of Massachusetts. And John Adams, as a representative of Massachusetts, is taken back by the words of George Washington. And he says, I thank you, kind sir, for your generous offer. And George Washington looks at John Adams and he says, not generosity, Mr. Adams, duty. An attack against the colony of Massachusetts is an attack against us all. And so Washington understood this required or called forth no praise from Mr. Adams. I am only doing that which I ought to do as the colonel of this army and soon to be general. And so Jesus then is going to bring this parable home in the clearest of ways because in verse 10, notice what he says, so you too. The disciples would not have been able to miss the application in this parable. So you too, he says, when you do all the things which are commanded you, this is what you are to say. We are unworthy slaves. 
We have only done that which we ought to have done. Jesus is saying to his disciples and to you and I this morning, understand that God is no man's debtor. And for us to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in any capacity far exceeds what is our due. The disciples needed to adopt that very attitude. You see, John the Baptist got this point and he understood it well. For he said, when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ, I am not fit to even stoop down and untie his sandals. Now, untying the sandals of another was considered the lowest and the meanest of tasks. And yet John the Baptist, because it involved the Lord Jesus Christ, well understood, I am unworthy to even perform that service. That's how glorious our Lord Jesus Christ is. And that's how privileged you and I are to be his servants. So think twice before saying to someone, I am merely the Lord's servant. There's no merely there. You have been given the highest of privileges to serve Jesus Christ and to be used of him in the advancement of his kingdom. I close with Luke 12, verses 35 through 37. Perhaps you've heard the words of Jesus Christ and there may be in your ears just a little bit of harshness to them. And you hear Jesus likening himself to this master who issues these directives with slaves who simply obey and recognize that they are not worthy of any praise. Well, understand this is where the kingdom of Jesus Christ over which he is Lord is the great upside down kingdom. This is where it is turned on its head. For in Luke 12 verses 35 to 37, listen to what Jesus Christ says that he will do as your Lord upon his return. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. In other words, be prepared for the return of your Savior. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. Jesus Christ, though he is Lord and Master, girds himself with the towel which he would shortly, after speaking these words, would do. And he washes the feet of his disciples. And he serves them, performing the meanest of tasks on those who would argue who is greatest in Jesus' kingdom. And he says he will do this yet again. So be ready for his return. For when he comes back, brothers and sisters, he says he will gird himself and we will recline at table and he will serve us. How unworthy we are of the overtures of grace and love that we find flowing from the lips and actions of our Savior. But this is the God we serve. Honor Him.